So yes, thank you for spending your Friday afternoon with us. Um, I'd like to urge you all to spend just a little more time with us after we finish, um, because immediately following this session, we're all going to meet to celebrate the end of the symposium together. Um, that celebration will be via Zoom, but in uh, meeting mode rather than webinar mode. So we will all be able to see each other. Um, so if you bring your favorite beverage, you can join us in a toast to everyone who has made this project happen, which they all deserve so much thanks. Um, and then we'd love to chat, hear feedback, or just hear how everybody has been. Um, we miss our colleagues, and I'm sure we all wish we could be doing this in person. Um, so uh, I think Margaret has put or is about to put a link to that in the chat. Um, so that'll happen after this. But uh, back to this session. So um, my name is Catherine Antonelli. I'm uh, the current digital archivist at the American Philosophical Society and the former project manager for In Her Own Right. Um, so obviously this project is very close to my heart. I'm thrilled to play a small part in the symposium. Um, in this session, we will hear from two presenters for about 20 minutes each, and then we will have about 20 minutes to ask them questions about their presentations. Um, attendees, as you probably know by now, cannot post in the chat, but if you have a question or a comment, uh, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit it. Um, and you can feel free to submit a question at any point of either presentation. Uh, we will address them at the end. As you uh, heard a minute ago, the session is being recorded. So if you have a question that you'd like to keep private, or even if we've run out of time um, before we're able to address your question, both of our presenters this afternoon have, <clears throat> have graciously agreed to furnish their contact information. Um, so at the end of the presentation, if you'd like to reach out to discuss their work, um, I'll post that in the chat. Uh, so our first presenter, is Dr. Lois Levine, and her full biography is available. It's linked in the chat now. Um, and uh, Lois, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm not going to be showing slides. Thank you all for sticking around for uh, Friday afternoon. It's been a really exciting um, symposium. I have so many connections that I could make to other people's papers, but I'll try and stay on time. Um, I am not putting up slides, but I did put a land acknowledgement in the chat and I invite you all to maybe think about the space that you're occupying and um, whose land it has been and, and what acknowledgement you wanna offer for that. Um, so, Beyond Mary Bowser is the title of my talk, Uncovering Black Civil Wars by Mary Richard Denman's Postbellum Activism. If you type the name Mary Bowser into an internet search engine, you'll get thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of results describing an African-American woman who spied for the Union during the American Civil War by posing as a slave in the Confederate White House. These accounts invoke America's beloved trope of an exceptional hero who succeeds against outstanding odds, adding a multicultural twist in which the hero is a woman of color. But most of what circulates regarding Mary Bowser is inaccurate, even the name Mary Bowser. And I'm not gonna talk about her own complex process of naming and renaming during her lifetime or why we misremember her by this name, but you can ask me during Q&A. Um, the dramatic increase in recent years of print and online accounts of this slave turned civil war spy reflects a growing public interest in black history and women's history. These accounts reflect an impulse to celebrate diversity that paradoxically presumes black women's history doesn't require diligent research. They also reinforce a feel good version of history that ends with emancipation obscuring how Mary Richards Demon allied with other activists to challenge postbellum racism. And as her biographer, I will tell you, there's actually much more documentation I found about her life after the Civil War than before or during. So brief biography. She was born into slavery in Virginia sometime around 1840. Mary was then sent to New Jersey as a young child by Elizabeth Bett Van Lu, the adult daughter of her enslavers, to be educated among free blacks. As a teenager, she was expatriated to Liberia at Bet's behest. Unhappy there, Mary returned to the US in 1860. She spent the Civil War in the Confederate capital where, as an educated black woman presumed to be a slave, she spied on behalf of the Union, part of an interracial underground network that brought together free blacks, enslaved people, and pro-Union Southern whites, including Bet Van Loon. After the war, 
Mary Richards Denman continued her work as an activist for racial and gender justice. She gave public lectures in the North in which she demanded equal rights for African-Americans. She founded and taught at schools for the newly emancipated in Virginia, Florida, and Georgia. She identified as a member of women's rights and other political organizations. She documented acts of white supremacist violence being committed or threatened against Southern blacks and their white allies. And as I detail in a forthcoming article in the Georgia Historical Quarterly, she publicly decried racial profiling by the police in Re Reconstruction era Savannah, an action which led to her own arrest and assault while in police custody. Throughout her life, she simultaneously invoked yet challenged racialized assumptions about proper female behavior to contest how her activism was portrayed in court proceedings and newspapers and how she was perceived by the government officials from whom she demanded racial justice. Now, given the breadth of these activities and the topic of this symposium, I'm gonna concentrate for this presentation on just two moments, autumn of 1865 and spring of 1866, to exemplify the archival and interpretive work historians must do to commemorate black women's political activism. My goal is both to show what we as historians do, but also how to, how to reposition how we might think about what the women we study did. In lieu of Hollywood style misrepresentations of cloak and daggery, excavating and contextualizing the traces of her life in disparate historical records reveals the political and rhetorical strategies that guided her wide ranging activism. Ultimately, we should explore Mary Richard Denman's thoughts and strategies and the thoughts and strategies of other women activists, particularly women of color, to bring attention not just to what they did, but why and how they did it. So I'm offering these examples today to document how she was enacting a black female activist citizenship that historians have too long ignored. So we begin autumn of 1865. On September 11th, she delivers a lecture to an interracial audience that filled the Abyssinian Baptist Church in Manhattan's Greenwich Village. Just a few weeks later, September 24th, she addresses another overflowing crowd at the Bridge Street AWME Church in Brooklyn. She appeared later that autumn at similar public events in New Jersey. And I wanna note that the fact that she was giving this series of lectures only months after the war's end suggests how quickly she had connected with networks of Northern black activists but her networks also included prominent white military officers from whom she bore letters attesting to her wartime contributions. So the promotions for these events variously billed her as quote, a colored lady connected with the secret service of our government, unquote, as quote, one who had risked her life often for the nation's life, unquote, and simply as quote, a US government spy, unquote. So clearly her work during the civil war was the hook to draw audiences and press coverage. But Mary Richards Denman used these engagements to outline the postbellum needs of African Americans, particularly in the South, and to demand that the nation deliver. So the lectures do give some details about her pre-war life and her activities during the war, but for this talk I'm going to focus on what they tell us about the life she worked to recreate for herself and for all African Americans during Reconstruction. There was much to be done on behalf of Black people, North and South, and she adamantly instructed her audience to do it. White Northerners, quote, owed the Negroes of the South a debt they could never repay, unquote, for profiting from businesses that had relied on or been tied to slavery. She decried behavior even of white abolitionists who refused to treat African Americans as their full equals. She also insisted that Northern Blacks should not be, quote, selfish regarding their own accomplishment by denying anything, especially education, to Southern Blacks. Indeed, quote, she advised all those who could to go south, unquote, to educate the newly emancipated. Nevertheless, in discussing the freed people schools, she denounced the, ra the racism that white teachers and the white religious and philanthropic organizations that employed them directed at black teachers, mistreatment she herself experienced. And she adamantly demanded political enfranchisement, quote, the bayonet has been put in the hands of the Negro. Another thing yet remains to be done he must have the ballot, unquote. She urged swift and stern punishment of Confederates, lest they continue their atrocities against African-Americans. Moreover, she attested that restoration of the union would be of little value unless the cause of full black citizenship was successfully pursued. Indeed, she warned, quote, justice must be done to our race. Do us justice, else an insurrection worse than anything that has yet taken place will be the result, 
unquote. Now, these words are very resonant in our own Black Lives Matter movement era when we are chanting no justice, no peace, but it's important to understand them in context. She did not mean that Blacks would rise up violently to seize the justice denied them as had happened in places like Haiti. Rather, she foresaw renewed insurrectionist activities by unrepentant Confederates. For a nation ravaged by four deadly and devastating years of war, the fragile peace depended on how millions of newly emancipated Blacks, as well as other African-Americans who had already been free, would be brought into refashioned legal, political, economic, and social systems. Now with the hindsight of history, we know that the wholesale insurrection that she predicted never came to pass, but that's only because of the many insidious ways that white supremacy became newly entrenched throughout the postbellum United States. More on that in a bit. As a biographer and historian, I rely on the coverage of these public lectures for details of Mary Richard Denman's life, as well as for an understanding of the strategies she saw as necessary and efficacious for securing full citizenship for Blacks in the US. Yet they are simultaneously incredibly rich and incredibly frustrating sources. We know about these lectures only through newspaper accounts. And if you have ever compared a public talk uh, as it was covered in multiple 19th century newspapers, you know that each article is limited by the imperfect memory as well as the perspectives and assumptions of its usually unnamed reporter. What we know about her talks in particular comes through public publications that ranged from the black owned Anglo-African to several overtly racist white newspapers and many publications that sort of fell between those two on the spectrum. We must work carefully with such sources. For example, it gives me pause to read assessments of this young black woman's body made by reporters who are almost certainly white men. They tended to focus on conveying the precise hue of her skin or curl of her hair. That is to say, on how near she was to whiteness. Yet these accounts also offer the most detailed physical descriptions of her in any historical sources I have found. There are no known photographs of this woman. And I think it's worth noting that the reporter from the Anglo-African offers no physical description, focusing instead on her humor and sarcasm, how interesting her lecture was and how appreciative her audience. There's also a further complication beyond the assumptions and limitations of the reporters and the newspapers who are publishing about her. Reading across these multiple accounts located in multiple archives, I discover what those in attendance at her lectures did not. In these lectures, Mary Richards Denman was testing rhetorical strategies, varying her approaches from one appearance to another, honing what might best induce audiences of black and white Northerners to act. To that end, she sometimes alters or invents biographical details, underscoring both her political agency and what such agency demands of us as interpreters of her words. Taken together, accounts of these talks tell us a great deal about her thoughts as well as her actions, about how she was perceived, but also how carefully she strategized to shape the way that she and Blacks in general were perceived. So now I'm gonna to shift to a very different source through which to understand her strategies as an activist, one that shows even more directly how she asserted her own authority to contest the re-entrenchment of white supremacy during reconstruction. So now we are at April of 1866. And she spent 1866 in several locations in Florida teaching the newly emancipated. I have been able to locate only a single document related to her time there, directly related to her time there. It is one of a series of letters she wrote to Colonel Thomas Osborne of the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen and Abandoned Lands in East Florida. People commonly refer to this uh, government agency as the Freedmen's Bureau, but I don't like to call it that because it was uneven at best in its treatment of African-Americans and its regard for their civil rights. Indeed, while living in Florida and then in subsequent years in Georgia, uh, Mary Richards Demon repeatedly wrote to implore the Bureau to act to stop a growing conspiracy to commit violence against the newly emancipated and their allies. Although only one of her 1866 Florida letters seems to have survived, this sole document reveals not only the extent of white supremacist violence in postbellum Florida, but also the complicated rhetorical and political strategies in which she engaged to challenge it. Black, female, and civilian, Mary Richards Demon recognized how easily her concerns might be disregarded by a white male government official, yet she insisted she deserved to be taken seriously. After acknowledging, quote, I am aware of the pressing duties of your position and therefore do not expect much notice to my letters, unquote. 
she nevertheless resisted having her correspondence dismissed as, quote, letters that perhaps you never read, or if you read them, you laugh and think only woman nonsense, unquote. Rather than laughable nonsense, her letter writing was, quote, a most solemn duty, unquote, and thus she enjoined him, quote, notice what I take the boldness to write, unquote. By invoking duty past and present, she deployed her wartime espionage to assert her own authority, declaring that, quote, Having been favored with being one of Uncle Sam's detectives in Richmond, I feel it my duty now when I see anything to report it, thanks or no thanks, unquote. And I just want to pause here because most accounts today depict her wartime work as spying, usually characterizing it as eavesdropping on Jefferson Davis or other whites whilst she's performing domestic labor in the guise of a slave. But she consistently described herself as a detective serving the federal government. And I just wanna posit that this connotes a far more active role that she saw herself as having in seeking out and piecing together information, as well as underscoring the government's reliance on her intelligence. And that intelligence now concerned the violent reality of white supremacy. She began her correspondence with Osborne by giving a lengthy count of a murder in the vicinity of a black man. And everybody knew what white man had killed him, but this man had not been arrested or tried. But she was doing more than just reporting on violence that had happened. Drawing on the skills she honed during the Civil War, she once again assumed an intelligence agent's investigative stance with the intention of preventing future violence. She informed Osborne of, quote, an organization about to be formed to undermine federal authority. She continued to identify herself as part of that authority and deposit the value of her assessments. Quote, before this place was occupied by our troops, there existed a band of, I do not know what to call them. They are called here regulators or cowboys. I have good reasons for thinking that they are about to reform themselves again, only it will be done with more secrecy than before, unquote. As in her talks in the North, she warned about possible wide-scale insurrection by unrepentant Confederates. Quote, the talk of 61 secession is brooding, unquote, among local whites who, quote, cannot form armies, but oh, these secret organizations, unquote. And if you feel echoes in the present day, I think that you should. The danger of these unreformed Confederates was clear to her, quote, each one calls himself militia and goes well armed, unquote. By contrast, the African-Americans the militias targeted were not equally armed. After listening to two presumably white men conversing, she reported, quote, one remarked to the other that it was well he did not lend his gun to a Negro whom he hired, for if he had, the Negro nor the gun either would not have been ever seen again. For the cowboys say they are going to exterminate Yankee settlers and Negroes, unquote. Aware that unreconstructed Confederates, civilian authorities, and even federal officials made a practice of preventing blacks from accessing or keeping guns, she demanded of Osborne, quote, now, Colonel, favor me with telling me whether or not it is unlawful for black men to carry arms, and still that these rebels and traitors are permitted to carry arms to shoot whomever they may choose, unquote. While she may have feigned uncertainty to press her point, she was quite certain that these secret organizations whites were forming should not be tolerated. She implored, quote, now, Colonel, is there no way to put a stop to this gang? For when they are once thoroughly organized, good union men and Negroes will vanish, unquote. Mary Richards Denman understood that the danger came not just from the overt violence of unrepentant Confederates, it also lay in the possible indifference of federal authority, white federal authority, including Osborne, whom she feared might not care whether African-Americans did indeed vanish. She did not hesitate to express this possibility in her correspondence to him, insisting as she had in her Northern lectures that freedom meant little without full protection before the law. Quote, it would have been better to let them remain in slavery if indeed you have made them free only to be robbed, cheated, and murdered by our mutual enemies, unquote. Now, this is a rhetorical flourish to be sure. Having risked her life to defeat the Confederacy, she was not advocating that slavery was in any way beneficial or preferable. Rather, she was once again insisting that emancipation alone was insufficient and that having freed the enslaved, the government must now also protect and empower them. If Mary Richard Denman's rhetorical flourishes allow us to understand her strategic thinking and calculated communicating, they also reveal her sense of social isolation. Throughout her correspondence with Osborne, 
she uses the term our to assert that she and he, and by extension, blacks and Northern whites more broadly, shared values, goals, and institutions. But in describing our mutual enemies, she also implies a difference between blacks and whites. Unrepentant Confederates might continue to resent Union soldiers like Osborne and what those soldiers represented, yet they embodied a far more deadly enmity to African Americans. Moreover, even as she wrote of, quote, our mutual enemies, unquote, Mary Richard Demon did not entirely posit herself as fully akin to the Blacks among whom she now found herself, having been singled out for particular attention from early childhood by her enslavers, having received her education within a free Black community in New Jersey, having lived among American Liberians in Monrovia, and having participated in the interracial underground ring in Richmond, she perceived herself as distinctly apart from and in many ways superior to the, mass, the vast majority of the newly emancipated. In imploring Osborne to protect the freed people from white supremacist violence, she repeated some of the harshest claims made about the newly emancipated. Quote, I know that these freedmen are as degraded and ignorant and in many cases, totally good for nothing. But Colonel, we should remember that they are humans and demand protection, unquote. Whatever degradation she perceived in those whose experiences of enslavement had been so dramatically different than her own, she nevertheless reminded both Osborne and herself of the full humanity of every African-American. That humanity had controverted the basic premise of slavery as an institution, and now it underscored the government's duty to protect them, even as it evidenced their right as Americans to ascend to full citizenship. Her own ascension to being one of Uncle Jet Sam's detectives in Richmond served as a model for what African-Americans might with proper government protection and unimpeded opportunity achieve. Moreover, her attainment of the role of detective also provided a platform she had deployed to persuade Osborne of the need for him to act. Quote, has our government got any good faithful detective in these counties? If so, I'm surprised that so much is going on that is detrimental to the good of our government and it is not reported to such officers as yourself, unquote. So Osborne, she's implying, should, thanks to her correspondence, be as surprised and as disturbed as she was to discover that he was not being properly informed by his staff of all of these threats to our government. She invokes both moral and military responsibility as she pleads, quote, Colonel, for God's sake, as a soldier, do what you can, unquote. She closes her five page letter by admonishing, quote, forgive me, Colonel, but listen to me, unquote. Neither Osborne nor any other military or government official responded to these letters. But what if they had? As historians increasingly underscore how the legacies of reconstruction still shape white supremacy and government policy in our own era, as we who are excavating women like Mary Richards Demon from the archives, we who are seeking to understand their citizenship as they envisioned and enacted it, we should also ask, what if BIPOC women's insights and expertise had guided federal and local policies in the postbellum era? What America might we enjoy now if their intelligence had been fully valued then? Thank you, and I look forward to Heather's paper and to the discussion that we will have uh, together as a group at the end of the session. Thank you so much. Um, that was quite a lot, and she sounds like a fascinating woman. Um, I'm really excited to get to have you two in conversation in a, in a minute. Um, Heather, if you can um, turn on your camera and unmute yourself, uh, then you can go ahead with your talk. Perfect. I'm going to share my screen real quick and then um, switch my camera over. Perfect. We can see that. Okay, perfect. Let me try and get this little panel out of here. Okay. All right, wonderful. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about um, freed women's um, relationships, particularly non-normative relationships, um, and how they both formed and protected these relationships um, following emancipation. 
Then I'd like to talk to you about one story in particular that um, I find really fascinating and that um, has lots of connections both to Lois's work and um, to the previous presentations today. Okay, um, so following the abolition of, um, um, of slavery in the United States, white reformers, both Northern and Southern, set their sights on regulating black freedom. The family was the centerpiece of freed communities as it had been in enslaved communities. As a result, those seeking to control black men and women first targeted black family. Freed, freed people were subject to local, state, and federal codes aimed to ensure authority over black sexuality, parenthood, labor, and mobility. To keep it simple, freed people um, were subjected to laws that meant monogamous, permanent marriage was their only legal option. Using the rhetoric of black patriarchy, reformers attempted to mandate male-headed households. Laws against cohabitation, adultery, and bigamy were some of the many used to enforce these normative family values. In reality, though, Black families were not so binary or simple. Families who lived through decades of slavery, a war, and emancipation had faced separations at every stage. To reduce these families to nuclear, male-headed units was at best obtuse. The separations caused by slaver practices and the upheaval of the war created networks of families throughout the South. At emancipation, it was common for a woman to have children with multiple partners or children who were the product of sexual assault. Women often found themselves raising non-kin children. It was not abnormal for a freed woman to leave an antebellum or wartime relationship to seek out a former partner or a new romance. It also very often happened that people found themselves reunited with more than one partner. Imagine all of these families attempting to reunite and rebuild after emancipation without technology, money, or transportation. Chaos seems a fitting word here, but nuclear, normative, permanent, those are less convincing. The complexity of these families and romantic relationships did not abruptly end at the request of white reformers in the wake of abolition. The evolving legal mandates of reformers did little to change the fundamental way freed women viewed their relationships or their role in them. Black women defined their romantic relationships by their community's expectations, their own experiences, and their spirituality. They operated within a spectrum of fluidity and obligation. For centuries, they did not, the law did not apply to them. It worked only to oppress them. Community-based relationships offered social acceptance and guidance for relationships that necessarily existed outside the law. The lack of legal status and the constant threat of separation led to increased fluidity in romantic relationships where bonds could be purposely temporary or take on more complex forms. The community continued to be a haven for extra legal marriages following emancipation. While some freed women chose relationships that fell within normative standards, many others did not. Often non-nuclear families had already been established. Some women chose to continue practicing fluidity. Others formed new relationships and freedom that existed outside the norm of legal standards. And even those that embraced legalized marriage frequently rejected the social obligations required by the marriage contract. New generations that came of age in freedom slowly adopted some traditional white notions of marriage. Those who lived through slavery and emancipation though were not apt to discard the relationships that they spent their entire lives sustaining. Black women were well-practiced in walking the narrow road between invisibility, resistance, and co-option. Freed women utilized this adept skill to navigate the law's role in their relationships. Where the law presented coercion in one instance, it offered liberation in the next. At any given time, freed women both weaponized the law to their benefit and subverted laws that sought to control them. 
In their desire to create their own vision of freedom, women in non-normative relationships practice evasion and subversion to protect their loved ones. Subversive and evasive activity due to its very nature was rarely documented. Formerly enslaved women were experts in wearing a mask that both hid their true intentions and portrayed an intentional narrative. The veil behind which freed women operated obscured a certain truth in the records that can't be read in the words on the page. By reading between and beyond the written words, it becomes clear that black women protected their relationships and themselves with not only visible, but also invisible means. Scholarship has focused on reunification and marriage legalization as positive outcomes for black families following the Civil War. And this certainly has contributed to our understanding of freedom and family. But focusing so closely on legal and nuclear families, we miss the extensive non-normative relationships that continued and evolved in freedom. Focusing on positive family experiences surrounding the Civil War makes it easy to neglect the less pleasant or messier histories that lay just beneath the surface. By listening to what the archival record says, we often miss what it doesn't. Not all freed people desired the permanent monogamous male-headed relationships thrust upon them at the end of slavery. The portrayal of those non-normative families as a moral failure is the product of specific messaging by those with a vested economic interest. Instead, black relationships centered on love and freedom. As Robin Kelly argues in Freedom Dreams, quote, freedom and love may be the most revolutionary ideas available to us. Still, he continues, as intellectuals, we have failed miserably to grapple with their political and analytical importance, end quote. Freed people's complex relationships and desires have been understudied. Black women's vision of freedom has been conflated with legalized marriage. This rosy image undermines how convoluted and at times onerous the transition from slavery to freedom was for black couples and families. Um, I'd like to now share with you um, the story I promised of um, just one non-normative family that's part of my research. Um, this story is of the Elmores, um, Jenny and Dorcas, the women at the helm of this polygamous family, um, exemplify this type of relationship I have been discussing with you. Um, in understanding the Elmore family, we will look at several government and personal records um, from around 1850 through 1937. Um, they are by no means the only three-headed household in the mid-19th century, which we heard earlier today. Um, the ability to follow this family from slavery through the end of the century in both legal and personal records, though, makes this story particularly interesting. There are lots of twists in the story um, and to fit it in the time, I'm going to tell it to you kind of quickly. So I have um, a timeline here for you um, that, that hopefully will help follow, help you follow along with the story. Um, Emmanuel Elmore Sr. married two women around the same time, Dorcas Cooper in Virginia and a woman named Jenny in South Carolina. Both began during slavery by quote, jumping the broom. Jumping the broom is a non-legally binding ceremony that would have been acknowledged by their communities as a permanent commitment. Dorcas gave birth to 16 children with Emmanuel over the span of two decades. While Jenny never had children of her own, she was, active, she was an active caregiver to Dorcas and Emmanuel's children. At some point prior to emancipation, Emmanuel Sr. and Dorcas were sold away from their family in South Carolina. In the absence of both parents, Jenny became the primary caregiver for the Elmore children. She nurtured and protected them until Emmanuel Sr. and Dorcas were able to each escape from Alabama where they had been sold and returned to South Carolina. Upon her return, Dorcas saw how well Jenny had cared for her children and decided, quote, that she liked her, end quote. And the three of them then lived together 
in, the, in one house as one family with the children. One of those children was Emmanuel Elmore Jr. He went on to tell his family's story late in his life. Although a young child, when the Civil War began, Emmanuel had clear, vivid memories of his family both before and after the war. Emmanuel's story of his family offers insight into his parents' relationship and how the three of them, along with their children, navigated regulations that made their very existence as a family illegal. Emmanuel had two mothers who shared a house and a husband. During Reconstruction, the Elmore family continued the relations they began during slavery. They do not fit neatly into the nuclear unit outlined by post-war idealists and their legal codes. Their family, not atypical under slavery, became criminal following marriage legalization. Following the war, we can trace the Elmore family into the 20th century through census, agricultural, and probate records. Um, in census records, Dorcas, Emmanuel, and the children are listed, but Jenny is not. Jenny does not appear in census reports before or after Dorcas's death. We know from Emmanuel's account of his parents' relationship that Dorcas passed much earlier than Jenny or Emmanuel. She suffered an illness while living on the Elmore plantation. Since Emmanuel purchased and moved his family onto a farm by 1880, at the latest, Dorcas could have passed in 1879. After her death, Jenny continued living with Emmanuel and raising the kids until they were out of the house. According to Emmanuel Jr., it was Jenny who was with his father when he passed in 1903. In his will, Emmanuel named each of his children, but refers to Jenny only as my wife. Jenny Elmore does not exist by name in any government records. If Emmanuel Jr. did not tell his life story in a WPA interview, Jenny would not exist in the historical record at all. She, like many Black women in the 19th century, would have fallen into the archival void created by intentional silence. Silence was often created by oppressors determined to maintain the dominant narrative. The names of enslaved persons were not recorded in the South Carolina slave schedule, which I have an example of for you here. Um, Emmanuel, his father and his mothers would have been in these registers, but they were reduced to merely their age, gender, and the name of their slave owners. Jenny's absence from antebellum records was a silencing by oppression. Her absence in the post-war period, however, as one of choice. Intentional secrecy created invisibility in the archives. Black women withdrew from the record, from the world of white men, and most importantly, from interference. Without Emmanuel's interview, these silences augmented by both oppressive and subversive efforts would have been permanent. Jenny's absence from the legal record demands the fundamental question, why? The Elmore's extra legal family would have contributed to Jenny's absence from the postbellum record. In chattel slavery, the Elmore's polygamous relationship would have been of little concern to lawmakers. Enslaved persons did not have the right to legal marriage or the ability to participate in a marriage contract. While the denial of the marriage contract empowered interference or separation by their oppressors, Enslaved families were not subject to the same regulatory definitions as white families. This meant polygamous family structures evolved. At times they materialized with intention and other times they were the result of separation and reunion with multiple partners. Emmanuel's relationship with Jenny and Dorcas originated from sale, separation and reunion with two partners, but it became an act of choice to continue living together as a family in Reconstruction. Emancipation did not occur within a bubble. The Elmores entered freedom in a moment when there was a moral crisis of family that meant monogamous permanent marriage was being debated at the highest levels of government. Mormon polygamy in the West 
rising divorce rates, prevalent prostitution, and slavery were all seen as threats to the stability of the American family. The moral, this moral crisis shaped the forming of legal marriage for freed people. Forced assimilation of Native American families would soon come out of the same moral panic. Why is Jenny not in post-war census records with Emanuel? Why is Dorcas's name listed despite her relatively early death? There are some straightforward legal explanations to these questions and some explanations that require a bit of in informed speculation. The 1866 South Carolina Order 14 outlined regulations for freed marriages. Within these restrictions was the requirement that if a man, quote, finds two wives restored to him by freedom, the one having children by him and the other not, he shall take the mother of his children as his lawful wife, end quote. Since Dorcas was the only wife to have children with Emmanuel Sr., she, not Jenny, was his lawful wife, and he would have been obligated to marry her. Even before the order was announced in 1866, anti-polygamy laws were in effect, preventing Dorcas, Jenny, and Emmanuel Sr. from legally continuing their relationship in, construction, in reconstruction. The consequences for the Elmores, if they were discovered living in a polygamous family, would have been devastating. In South Carolina, where the Elmores lived, punishment for breaking marriage laws included six months in jail or a $500 fine which would have been multiple years income for most freed people. We know that Jenny continued living in the house, even though it was Dorcas and Emmanuel Sr. who appeared on census records together. Relying on both Emmanuel's narrative and legal codes, it's most likely that Jenny took on the role of mother and wife in the Elmore household, but used Dorcas's name for legal documents. We can also deduce that Emmanuel's reference to his wife instead of naming Jenny in his will, was a strategic decision to maintain Jenny's invisibility in the record. There are several reasons that, even after Dorcas's death, Jenny would have chosen this level of invisibility. Perhaps Dorcas and Emmanuel were entitled to a pension, either from the war or Emmanuel Sr.'s years as an iron worker. Remarrying could have complicated or lost that pension. Additionally, South Carolina marriage laws required a quote, period of two years, end quote, before remarriage. But Jenny would have already been living in the house. Cohabitation, however, was illegal and punishable by the same fines and imprisonment. Had a legal agent asked who Jenny was in that period of two years, she would have had to be Dorcas and this would have restarted the waiting period. Finally, it may have just been more advantageous to continue using Dorcas's name. Dorcas had legal rights and protections over the children that Jenny would not. Marriage certificates cost time and money, and Jenny had already been part of the family for decades. Whichever the reason, Jenny's invisibility in the record was intentional. Acknowledging Jenny's intentional absence from the record raises additional queries. What did the inconsistencies between Emmanuel's narrative and the legal record reveal? If readers are to be critical of the discrepancies between Emmanuel's interview and the sparse legal records from the 40 or so years following emancipation, they must also think critically about why these inconsistencies exist. What would Emmanuel gain from fabricating details about his life? But also, what does the family gain by subverting the legal system with purposeful silence? What protection might invisibility bring? I find it far more compelling that the Elmores were aware and calculated about their recorded legal interactions. Humans are messy and complicated, whereas the law is rigid and cold. The Elmores had to shield their family from the law and therefore the record. The realities unmasked when we consider what the archives are hiding exposes a deeper layer of human nature and its intricacies. Simply put, Dorcas and Jenny did not fit neatly into the plans white reformers and policymakers drew up for them. Despite a complex system of regulations designed to control black women's freedom and love, they defined their own families and freedom. Free people's responses to post-war regulations were a mosaic of legality, intention and rationale. 
Like Jenny and Dorcas, many women did not choose legal monogamous permanent marriage. Instead, they weaponized resources to protect their relationships and rejected the claims placed upon them. These women exemplify the need for a reconsideration of how freed women viewed and responded to marriage legalization. While it's certainly appropriate that historians have paid such great attention to the family reunification following the Civil War, we need to expand our definition and therefore our conversation of what family is. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. It's a fascinating story. Um, if you can stop sharing your screen, um, and Lois, if you can uh, unmute yourself whenever you're ready to talk. I see your camera's already yes. on. Yes. I am. Okay, great. And we do have uh, one question in the chat so far. I also have my own questions. Uh, but uh, if anyone thinks of anything, uh, feel free to continue submitting your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, and uh, I guess we can begin. Let's see. So um, first, after, um, did, did either or both of you see um, Martha Jones's keynote last night? Yes. OK, that's OK. Um, <laughs> The uh, point that I'd like to reflect on is, is the idea of remembrance. Um, and her, her keynote was recorded like this session and will be made available in a few weeks. Um, but both of your presentations deal with the ways that we are or are not remembered um, by others in, in the historical record and the ways that Black women forged their own identities, um, whether that choice was for political protection or uh, personal motive or, or other reasons. Um, so Lois, I wonder if you might talk about how uh, Denim navigated this process of identity creation, which seemed to be fluid for her. And, and as you teased, um, how she took the power of naming into her own hands. Um, and then Heather, if you could respond after. Sure, so I'm happy to start. Um, there's naming and then there's other forms of remembrance. So. I should say that the reason that we misremember her as Mary Bowser is in 1910, so almost 50 years after the Civil War, a reporter for Harper's is writing an article about Bette Van Lu and wants to include some reference to this Black woman, one of many instances in which she is included to add color, as it were, to depictions of white spies. And they interview, Bet is deceased by this point, they interview Bet's niece who says, I don't really remember much. They never told me much about the war. I was very young, but I know that the one thing I remember is that her name was Mary Elizabeth Bowser. And then she also adds a few other details, none of which are true. Um, 50 years has passed since the war. She was very young. So think about uh, somebody that was friends with your aunt when you were a very young child and what you would remember about them. Um, and for years, Nobody could find anything about Mary Bowser, uh, except for one marriage record of uh, Wilson Bowser and Mary, servants to Eliza Van Loo, Beth's mother, who were married in the Van Loo's church, so a white church in 1861, just before the Civil War starts. Um, and I'm really lucky that uh, Elizabeth Varon wrote a fantastic biography of Beth Van Loo in which she researches as many black members free and enslaved of the interracial underground that she could. And she says, well, I can't find anything else about this Mary Bowser, but there's this Mary Richards who seems to have been enslaved by the Van Loos. Um, and building on her foundation, I've discovered a great deal. So like Jenny, I guess I would call her Jenny Elmore, Heather not or <laughs> disagree, but like Jenny, Mary seems to have avoided being recorded in many of the typical records we would look to like census documents. She also, during her marriage to Wilson Bowser, which does not even last as long as the Civil War, uses a variety of different surnames. Um, I think like many newly emancipated people, self-naming was really important to her. The, her enslavers called her Mary Jane and in her adulthood she dropped the Jane and largely just went by Mary or Mary J. But she uh, 
took, by the time she was 30, she had acquired and discarded three husbands. So Wilson Bowser is the first of those. There are two others. Um, and the third one, she keeps his name long after their marriage ends. Although I look, lose traffic, track of her when she's in her early 30s. And I don't know whether that means she died and her death wasn't recorded or whether it means that she married yet again, or for some other reason, took another name, right? So this is both the um, challenge of researching women in an era when many women married and took new names. Um, if you look for Mary Deadmonds, you find a lot of Irish immigrants. So there's also, you know, how quickly can you discern that the Mary Deadman in this record is not actually the Mary Deadman that you're looking for? Um, but I think more than that, the talks that I mentioned that she gave in the North, she used not one, but multiple pseudonyms for those talks. And they were very theatrical. Richmonia Richards, Richmonia St. Pierre. And I think that that's also a different kind of self-invention. In fact, at one of those talks, somebody, a reporter in the audience compares her to Anna Dickinson for those people who heard the talk about Anna, Anna Dickinson in the last session. So she's very aware of that kind of public persona. She's also aware that when she is when she's bad mouthing racial profiling by the police in Savannah, that in court records, she appears under multiple names. And I think some of that may be about her quasi legal marriage. Her third husband was white and it was, Georgia was uh, the state that was most heavily regulating against interracial marriage in the period right after the civil war. So it was again, as with the example Heather gave, not a legal marriage, but but I think also there was a way in which she, she is a public performer or even in, as a private citizen writing her angry letters to the um, you know, federal officials in Florida and Georgia wants to claim her authority, but she also does not want anybody else to label her or put her in a box or uh, to use a term that is definitely loaded when you're talking about the formerly enslaved to capture her in any way. And, I think it's also important to acknowledge that I'm doing this work, and I think Heather, we talked about this offline, that we're doing this work in a moment when there have been a, a lot of scholarship about what it means to look for particularly the enslaved and formerly enslaved, including the self-liberated in archives, when historians have been theorizing what it means to try and find or capture as historical subjects, people who are evading being found or evaded being captured as part of a strategy of survival. Um, I don't know if I answered your question at all or just complicated all of the notions <laughs> implied in the question, but th that's, that is part of what makes this such a rich and fascinating topic, both the individual I'm writing about, but I think also the way that we're thinking about African-American history, especially African-American women's history in the 19th century as historians in the 21st century. Now I'll let Heather take the floor. I think the point you were you were making about the archives um, and how there's, you know, these women enter the archives for just a moment, you know, this fragmentary history that we have of them and their names could be different the next time they enter the archive and we would have no way of knowing that. Um, so sometimes we only have just a moment from their lives and having 40, 50 years of the Elmore family is what makes them exceptional, not that they're a polygamous family. That is not a unique thing. The unique thing is that I can trace them for 50 years. <laughs> um, so I think this, um, this idea of fragmentary history is, is something that more and more historians are, are engaging that um, reading between the lines instead of actually reading the lines um, gives us more history. And on that note, um, in the Q&A, uh, uh, there's a more of a request. Um, it says, I am especially personally interested in um, Bryn's research about non-monogamous and non-conventional family dynamics in Antedon and Reconstruction Era America. Um, and any recommendations for further reading would be appreciated. So I don't know if you can um, expand on that or if you'd prefer that they uh, contact you. As promised, I should put your contact information in the chat. So I'll do that now. Sure, I'd be happy to give um, a list of readings by email, but I can just briefly talk about what these um, 
non-normative relationships look like on a bigger scale because polygamous relationships are one small fragment of it. Um, what happens on what happens with more frequency is that women are acting with fluidity. They're moving from one relationship to another based on when it's advantageous um, and, and what is the best situation for them or for their children. Um, and because there's this moral crisis going on in, in the United States at that time, divorce continues to be a legal question. South Carolina didn't even pass um, divorce laws until after the Civil War. So um, you're dealing with these kind of um, if these women who are taking on fluidity and then the laws that aren't set to deal with that. Um, and so that's why you see them um, either ignoring or subverting the laws um, and then other times utilizing the laws when it, it brings them um, financial resources, when it enables um, mobility, um, when it helps them negotiate a labor contract but then also when it prevents them from moving from one relationship to another, they go around the law. Um, so I would suggest um, just contact me by email and um, I'm happy to give a further reading list. Um, but on a larger scale, these relationships look um, like many things that are on a spectrum of dating and hooking up and getting married and living together and, um, yeah. And I think it's worth noting that the we think of polygamy as uh, one male partner, multiple wives, but that's not necessarily the case, right? That, that, that um, particularly because women might feel bound to men with whom they had consensual relationships and had children, there were often also cases like that where she is the locus of a family that has multiple partners, multiple fathers. It, it's really a complicated thing. And I have kind of a follow-up question for you, Heather, but did you want to say anything to what I just I said? I was going to build on what you just said and then, yeah. and then ask yeah. me. Um, but what you were saying about women that have multiple partners, um, the law that I mentioned from South Carolina says that whoever she has children with is who she has to marry, right? But what if she had children with multiple partners? Um, so then it gets complicated. And then there's times when she marries someone new in freedom, and then a former partner that she had a child with shows up to claim her as his wife. Um, so there's so many intricacies and in, in ways that um, it gets complicated. Um, and you're right, it's not just two women and, and a male partner, this happens in the reverse as well. Yeah. And you know, you, you just made me think about, there's a new podcast, Seizing Freedom, uh, with Kandata mm -hmm. Williams, who's a yes. wonderful historian um, as the writer and host. And they, she talks a lot about this. This is a great podcast as, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of pop history is more pop than history. And she's a historian driving that project. But what I wanted to ask about, I don't know whether you've thought about this all at all, is the concept of bastardy. Um, and I, this comes to me through Karen Gustafson, who's a, actually a law professor at uh, UC Irvine and has not yet published her research on this, but she's given some talks that are available online. Um, because bastardy was, was often used, I mean, it was used much earlier just to criminalize women's sexuality, but it is used particularly um, in the antebellum and especially during reconstruction period to dispossess black families of their children, to dispossess black children of their inheritance. Because if you are not in a maritally condoned product of that kind of union, then you could be taken from your family and um, forcibly indentured, which was a, essentially a way to re-enslave people uh, during emancipation. Um, and as I said, dispossessed of family wealth because you, couldn't, you lost inheritance rights. And I wondered about that particularly, I have to admit, I'm a little suspicious about Dorcas had all of the children, Jenny had none of the children, but whether there's a possibility that Dorcas is, a, is the biological mother of record, but not necessarily the biological mother. So one question is about bastardy, and I guess a related question is, we all know that speaking of incredibly rich, but also complicated resources, um, 
the WPA narratives, like Emmanuel Jr. must have been quite young when slavery ended and mm -hmm. quite old when he's fairly old when he's giving that interview. How do you decide how much you trust his, his recollection, what he was told by his family and what his recollection was? So I'm gonna answer the, the children part first and then I'll answer the WPA part. But um, both in the records and from Emmanuel, um, it's said that Dorcas is the only one that has children. So although it's completely possible that Jenny also has some of these children, um, neither the legal or the personal records indicate it. So it could go either way. Um, the WPAs, I completely agree. They're, are questions to be had there. The stories that he tells about his father in some cases are before he was born. So that has to be informed by stories that his family told him. But do we believe the censuses that happened once every 10 years and that five minute interaction with a legal agent more than we believe Emmanuel Jr.'s narrative about his family? To me, the answer is no. Um, I think that his five page narrative about his life story and his family story um, has a lot more legitimacy, even if there are discrepancies. Um, and I think what's interesting are the discrepancies and not necessarily if he got something wrong, which is completely possible, right? He, he was very old when he gave this interview. Um, but I think those discrepancies are what reveal the most interesting things. Uh, that actually um, connects to something I'm curious about. And although uh, technically we were supposed to end at 4.45, if you're um, both willing to go for a little longer, then yeah, I'm <laughs> having fun listening to you as well. Um, so hopefully we can squeeze in too, but um, the discussion of the, um, the Federal Writers Project uh, interviews. Um, recently, I read a piece in The Atlantic, um, and I'll, I'll put it here about those interviews. Um, so essentially, they uh, the narratives themselves were taken by WPA volunteers. Um, they may have been accurate, but in, in some cases, they were changed or embellished in different types of ways, um, which is another layer of complication on these stories. Um, so I'm curious, since all sources are, are biased in some way, I'm curious how both of you um, as non-Black women researching, writing about Black women's experiences, um, take into account your own biases and then uh, in turn, how you take into account the potential biases of your source materials. Can I jump on this first, Lois? Is that okay? Sure. Okay, I think um, I'll answer first the WPA question and then get into my own bias and how I, I answer that question. Um, I have actually come across records in the archives where it's the original version of the WPA where they've taken the interview and it's typed up and then it's like scratched out and edited. And so these records are obviously not 100% word for word Emmanuel Jr.'s or whoever else's um, interview. They always stay generally the same large scheme you know I don't think Jenny would be completely made up there's you know no evidence that he, the interviewer would just completely make up a person that is in the entire interview um, but of course you have to approach it with um, a level of again what's between the lines and what's not not what's on the page um, because I think what's on the page is flawed just like what's in you know, government records and um, what like these slave schedules where I don't have their names at all. I just know that somewhere on there, they're listed by age. Um, so I think just like with the rest of my records, I, I approach that understanding that they're going to be biased, um, but that what they can reveal um, is where discrepancies come between legal records and and narrative records. Um, as far as my own biases, I think being upfront about it is the most um, realistic thing I can do. Um, 
I'm a white woman who grew up in the South. So, you know, I have to, to own those things about myself and also recognize how that could affect um, what I'm reading or what I'm writing or interpreting. Um, and I think the active thought of keeping that in my head while I'm looking at archives, um, while I'm engaging with my material, does, does me good to um, approach my own work, understanding where my intersectional identity impacts um, how I'm viewing these women. And I guess I'll follow up on that. I don't use WPA sources directly, so I have less to say to that. Although there are also issues about who was doing the interview, how they were being recorded, lots of, lots of things. But in terms of Every time somebody starts one of the sessions at the symposium saying, well, let's do a little housekeeping. I am reminded yet again of Audre Lorde's amazing essay, The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House, which is literally about a women's, I think it's a women's studies conference, not women's history per se, but a women's studies conference in which she says, white women, who is keeping your house and looking after your children while you're at this conference, right? Audre Lorde was so foundational to me when I was an undergraduate in thinking about the call that she and many other black women, Bell Hooks, June Jordan, I could keep listing um, influences. To say you can't talk about gender without talking about race and class. And I think now we would add sexuality and uh, ableism and disability. We become even more fluent in all of the ways that we bring assumptions to our work. Um, so, and this field has changed so much in the time that since I was in Heather's position of writing a dissertation, there, there are a lot more people who are trained to focus on African-American history and are doing work. Like I never thought I would wanna read a work of uh, economic history, but it turns out um, The Price for Their Pound of Flesh is a riveting book that I would not have imagined I wanted to read until there was somebody to write it. So I think some of it is always wanting to learn more from historians who are pushing the field and pushing the way we think about it. As I said, looking specifically at people who aren't just talking about omissions from the archives, but omissions around black history, black women's history, around women who had experience. You know, I, I mentioned this arrest that she went through in Savannah. I think she was probably sexually assaulted, but it is never stated that way. Although there's this discrepancy between the police officers, one of the police, uh, calls her the worst woman I ever locked up. And I'm like, you go girl, right? But they're talking about her physical resistance and the argument that she and her lawyer, who's a white man, but an ally make are any woman would resist the kind of improper behavior that the police were enacting on her body, right? Um, back to my position. I think always trying to check in with what are the assumptions that I'm bringing? Who can I be learning from? and um, and just to think about when, when, whenever we talk about any of this, how to be really forethoughtful at the foreground of our thought about how race, how class, how region, I, I, you know, her time in Florida is the first time that she lives in the deep South. Most of her time in, in uh, the South is in Richmond, which is urban industrialized and essentially the North of the South in Virginia. I think some of what she says about black people there her condescending comments have to do with the fact that she is a little bit snobby about the rural, which is still a snobbery that many of us carry today, right? Um, again, also always being able to listen to the people who wanna criticize the work and critique the work and take the feedback and say, not, oh, but here's the reason I did it this way, but thank you, I really appreciate your thoughtful input for pushing me in, in my thinking and my work. And maybe that's also why these are such captivating probably a totally awful term to use. These are such enthralling topics for us to write about as historians is exactly that, that they are pushing us to get beyond, oh, well, is it, you know, are these non-normative relationships or is normative a construction that we need to throw out the window? And these are actually true relationships. When I write about Mary's uh, relationship to marriage, I'm always careful to note that just because white culture was saying you had to have a particular kind of marriage doesn't actually mean that all white people were engaging in those relationships. I think white people were also moving in and out of relationships as suited them 
financially, romantically, sexually, legally, religiously, however they were doing it. Um, so also thinking about what we can learn about doing good history in general by doing good African-American history. Excellent. Thank you um, so much to both of you for sharing your work today and for sticking around. Um, and thanks to all of our attendees who we've <laughs> retained most of them, um, which I'm not surprised by because this has been great. Um, so as I said at the beginning, um, next up is our toast to the sponsors who made the event possible, all the presenters who were involved and um, the people who set it all up. So uh, please meet us in the Swarthmore room, which is linked in the chat, it's, um, the other Zoom room. Um, and uh, yeah, have a great, great weekend and a great rest of Women's History Month. Thanks, Thank you. Uh, Let's keep the conversation going. We'll I see know. in the other room. <laughs> <laughs> Lois, I was going to say my response to what you were just saying was it's this kind of idea where intersectionality meets interdisciplinary work. I mean, I, I think it's like that the cross of so many different subjects and so many different identities. And we're just now starting to grapple with all of those things. And um, like for me, you know, you didn't ask me, we should go in the other room. Well, you didn't ask me about the fact that I wrote a novel about this person before I started doing her, the, a real biography of her. And that's a long, complicated answer, which we can talk about later yeah. in the other room or wherever. But that yesterday there was a point where um, I think Courtney Murray in their wonderful panel of that Penn State grad students was talking about like, get out of your, in, your disciplinary restrictions, right. have some fabulous imaginings. And it's like, I love that that's like the, that it's sort of come full circle. Sadia mm -hmm. Hartman's work was really influential to me when I was a grad student, but that book had, or that article hadn't been published yet. It was her first book that had just come out. Um, okay, so let's go be for a okay. drink. I'll see you all there. <laughs> Thank, thank you all. We'll see you over there. Thanks. Heather, do you have the other link? Just want to make sure before I shut this one down. I do, Margaret. I'm good. Okay, I want to make sure Heather had it. Heather, do you know where we're going? She's got her sound. Oh, I'm in the other room. <laughs>